morning. I'm Willie Kempton. I have a slide set, but I'll just uh, proceed and let the slides catch up with me. Uh, <coughs> I'm uh, director of the Center for Carbon-Free Power Integration at the University of Delaware. I very much appreciate being invited to this panel. I'm going to talk about um, the, uh, as uh, Dr. Andrew said, uh, the uh, use of electric vehicles for storage for uh, renewable energy that uh, fluctuates, that doesn't, uh, doesn't come in uh, in a steady way. <clears throat> um, so uh, plug-in vehicles uh, for, uh, for leveling fluctuating renewables. Uh, I want to start, though, by looking, uh, could we back up? <clears throat> uh, start with the question of uh, what sort of renewables are we going to be using? Uh, uh, we saw that large map that went all the way out to the Midwest, and from a Midwest ISO standpoint, uh, they, they think, well, we've got lots of uh, wind energy here, so we're sure all those folks on the east would like to have very, very long transmission lines to take it out to them. Uh, but I think New Jersey and, and uh, Delaware and Rhode Island have a little bit different idea of how to approach that. So I want to look at the carbon-free inventory that we have in the mid-Atlantic. And I'll use Delaware as an example where we've really bored down and, and tried to look in detail. But by just scaling uh, the numbers or the proportions at least would be very similar for New Jersey. Uh, and uh, the problem will come to then uh, from that resource inventory is that we have fluctuating, our large sources are fluctuating ones and so we look at plug-in vehicles as one way of leveling that um, and Samir next we'll be looking at uh, another source a more centralized storage source so uh, just taking Delaware as an example uh, active solar program in the state uh, we've got one offshore wind plant approved by the state and uh, with uh, Amardeep Danju uh, we've just done a state inventory of low co2 resources actually also some high co2 resources uh, there's a uh, website there, but if you search for the uh, Delaware Energy Plan or the Governor's Energy Advisory Panel, you could probably find it without look, remembering that long uh, URL. And as I'm uh, arguing, I think the proportions will be very similar here. Next slide. <clears throat> so uh, there's a lot of analysis behind this, and some of you may want to know where each number came from. But basically, we looked at the rooftop area in the state. They, the, uh, another institute in Delaware did that. Uh, and what's south-facing, what's a reasonable amount. If you really tried to fill every reasonable square meter of rooftop area, uh, how much windy areas do we have on land? And then how much offshore, where we took a look at the depths of water that are practical with today's technologies, eliminated shipping lanes, bird flyways, and so forth, where you couldn't build wind farms for biofuels. We just said, this is a thought experiment. Let's take all of our agricultural land, stop growing food in Delaware, and only grow biofuels. So these are uh, measures that maximum amount available, uh, not necessarily a practical uh, program, although with uh, rooftop PV and offshore wind, I don't really see any reason not to sort of fill up the available uh, space. Uh, we also just looked at uh, outer continental shelf oil and gas. Uh, there's a lot of excitement about this resource in the presidential campaign, drill, baby drill, and all that. So we wanted to look at the size of that in comparison to some of these low carbon uh, resources. So we're going to look at cost, uh, and then the capacity is the total amount, but these fluctuating resources like solar and wind that you don't get that all the time. So the last column is the one we're going to focus on, which is the average out put in megawatts. And you'll see this graphically in a minute, but look at the bottom column there. Just electricity, state of Delaware is using 1,300 megawatts. So that's sort of our benchmark. Can we get to that? Can we get it from all non-carbon sources? Just look one column up. Offshore oil and gas, if you take sort of Delaware's fraction of all the stuff out in the Atlantic, uh, and we burned it for power, uh, over a 20-year period, we'd get a quarter quarter of our electricity, a much smaller fraction of our vehicle fuel. So offshore oil and gas is not really a solution that's of any significant size. And of course, that's gone in 20 years, whereas most of the others are constant, you know, uh, infinite time sort of resources. The one that really stands out is offshore wind, uh, which is several times the state's uh, 
demand for electricity, so we're going to need to look at other, our other two major sources, uh, heating fuels, building fuels, and uh, uh, sorry, no other needs, and uh, uh, transportation liquid fuels. So, okay, next slide. So just in terms of cost, I'm not going to dwell on this, but today's power is uh, a, about the same amount as the cost of offshore wind in this, in this region. Um, if you want to make electricity, offshore oil and gas, uh, oil in particular is going to raise that cost a little bit. PV is quite a bit more expensive, um, that is photovoltaics. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> but I want to focus on the resource size. So uh, uh, the uh, top bar is what we need now, um, and this is what actually gets to do work. So electricity, you know, you knock off maybe 10 or 20 percent for transmission and stuff. Oil there is actually delivered transportation energy. So it's actually maybe five times more that we're using. But that's what actually gets to turning the wheels. And when you compare with electricity, that's the right comparison. Because with a liquid fuel like biofuel or uh, petroleum, you throw away about 80 to 85 percent of the energy before you turn the wheels. With electricity, you throw away about 15 percent. Hydrogen is about halfway between 